هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا هذا القرآن هو الهامي لأوائلنا وأواخرنا يدعو للعلم وللعمل لا شيء سيء أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم um first if we can come a little bit closer make the circle a little bit wider here so everyone can fit um unfortunately we didn't begin the lecture with an introduction of our first speaker uh, his name is Brother Anir Saeed. He is currently a student of Sharia um, at Al Azhar University. Inshallah, he'll be finishing soon. And he's an instructor for Islamic Learning Foundation. Um, just in case anyone was wondering, Brother Adler, if you have any questions for him, uh, please uh, let him know. He's doing his uh, degree in Sharia right now. And Inshallah, he will be uh, teaching for us in the future. Um, my name is Brother Abdul Sattar, and I have no such qualifications, but I'm just here to give you some advice that I copied from people that I know. So inshallah, uh, whatever benefits you will benefit you. Um, the part that I will be talking about is the portion of the hadith in which we are seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the qalb that does not feel khushu. Min qalbin la yakhsha. Something is very important about the way this hadith is phrased. Normally when you ask Allah, do you ask Allah for stuff or do you ask Allah to keep you away from things? In most of the in most of the du'as, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, and then when you come to the point, you say what? Ihdina siratun mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path, right? You say Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilmu nafi. Right? You say Allah, give me knowledge that benefits. Other places, Allahumma afini fi badani. Allahumma afini fi sami. Allahumma afini fi basari. Allah, give me good health in these things. Give me good health in my eyes. Give me good health in my sight. You ask Him four things, but in this du'a. You're doing what? You're asking refuge from stuff. That's very interesting. Why do you think we're doing that? Normally, we know that a good good aim comes from who, guys? Comes from whom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that a qalab that fears him comes from whom? Allah. We know that an eye that can cry for the sake of Allah comes from where? From whose blessing? Allah. So rather than ha asking him for these things, which actually the Prophet ﷺ does in other ahadith, we are asking refuge from things here. So the first point that I want us to all think about is if you look at these things, if you guys, if we want to go out and, and get unbeneficial knowledge, whose action causes that to happen? If I get unbeneficial knowledge, whose fault is that? Mine. So I'm seeking something that is what? Harmful for me. Right? I'm going after something that's harmful for me. And so this hadith is about asking Allah to protect myself from my own screw-ups. That's number one. I'm protecting, I'm asking him, Ya Allah, protect me from the times that I mess up. Right? From unbeneficial knowledge. Because I know I'm gonna seek after it. I know I'm gonna do things that are dumb, right? I know I'm gonna spend nine hours on Wikipedia looking at stuff that I shouldn't be looking at. I know I'm gonna know things I shouldn't know. I know John from ninth grade is going to come in with a magazine I shouldn't be looking at. I'm going to learn things I should know. Right? Be honest. So these are my mistakes that I'm going after and I'm asking Allah, Ya Allah, protect me. So number one, we have to recognize that our humility before Allah starts with recognizing that I'm flawed, I'm sick, and I need your help. I need you to protect me, Ya Allah, because I can't protect myself. Are you guys with me with that? Number one. That's the beginning of this hadith is that we're asking, any time you ask refuge in Allah from something, you are recognizing your own weakness. Okay, number two. 
Sorry guys, Android is taking a second to start up here. Okay. Number two. Is that... Look at this hadith. It's saying, I want to seek refuge in you, Ya Allah, from a heart that does not feel your fear. Now whose heart is this? It's my heart, right? If I have control over anything in the world, what do I have control over? This heart. Yes or no? Right? I might not have control over my car. I might not have control over my house. I might not have control, have control over my halal or haram mortgage. Right? I might not have control over my job. But I have, we all have control over our what? Our hearts. But here I'm asking Allah, Ya Allah, protect me from a heart that doesn't fear you. Why am I asking Allah? If you look at another dua of the Prophet ﷺ, we find what? Ya muqallab al-qulub, thabbit. What? Qalbi ala dinik, aw qulubina. Protect, you know, uh, oh, you who is the turner of hearts, turn my heart towards your deen, or turn our hearts towards the deen. So, second point, what we're recognizing is not only am I weak, but even this heart that I think that I have dominion over, I think that I have dominion over this qalb, Allah has dominion over this qalb. Allah is the owner of this heart. He gave it to me to allow me to feel. Are you guys with me? That is something we have to recognize before we start doing things with this heart. Because we are saying Allah is the turner of hearts, and even the thing that I thought I owned, I'm relying on Allah to keep it healthy, to keep it fixed, to keep it clean. I'm relying on Him for it. So this, as Ibn Atallah al-Iskandari, he mentions, should focus us in recognizing the fact that I am not somebody who has the tools for success in and of myself. Allah has given me an opportunity to make decisions, but the ability comes from Allah. Right? The ability comes from Him. So this should create such a reliance in our hearts that we never ever feel arrogant about the cool stuff that we do, about the fact that we are sitting in a halaqah, about the fact that someone's giving lecture or khutbah, about the fact that we pray. We shouldn't feel like this is something that I accomplished. We should say, Alhamdulillah that Allah gave me the opportunity to come here and do this, and all praise is due to Him. And the thanks is due to Him that He gave me the ability to say Alhamdulillah. And this is why you find in the Qur'an, وَإِن تُعُدُّ نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ لَا تُخْسُوهَا If you were to count the favors of Allah, you would not be able to count them. Why is that? Because when you count it the first time, you should thank Allah that He allowed you to count His favors. And then you should thank Him that He allowed you to count His favor. Then you should thank Him that He allowed you to recognize that He is the one who gave it to you. And that He allowed you to recognize because there are people who don't recognize Allah. They have no ma'rifah of Allah, no recognition of Allah. Can you imagine going through life in such a state that you don't even know who created you? You don't know who made you? You don't know what you're doing with yourself? So that recognition in and of itself is something we should be grateful for. So khushu, when we ask Allah, Ya Allah, protect us from a heart that doesn't feel khushu. I want you guys to think about something. Have you guys ever seen, all of us have seen a dead body or have, has, has noticed someone who's died, right? We know somebody who's died. What is the difference between a dead body and a living body in Islam? Someone just, so just shout it out, it's not school, so the ruh, the soul, the spirit, right? And we'll consider them the same in English because Arabic has different words, but we'll call them, we'll call it the soul of the individual, <coughs> the soul of the human being. When this soul is inside the body, we take care of everything for that person. That person could be in a coma and we will spend thousands of dollars of life support to do what? Keep that person alive. Yes or no? If we know that our father, our mother, our wife, our daughter, our, our son, anybody was, the soul was still there, the, the body is still alive, they could be in a coma. Would you will be willing to shell out thousands of dollars to keep them alive so one day they might wake up? Yes or no? Yes, of course you would. You, you do whatever you could to keep that body alive. Why? Because the ruh is there. That person is alive. You believe that they're there. Once the ruh is removed, once the ruh is taken out of the body, do you care about that body? If that body, if, if, if a child has the ruh in them, they're alive, and he, he gets a cut on his finger, what does the mother do? Runs up to it, kisses the child, the child is crying, puts a band-aid on the child's finger. Any little thing that happens to that child, she'll take care of it. The father will take care of it. If the soul is gone from the body, do you care what happens? If there's a small cut? 
No, you wash the body, and what's the first thing you want to do to that body after you wash it? Get rid of it. You want to bury it. Yes or no? If you ask the person who used to sleep next to that body to sleep next to it after it's dead, after the room is gone, would, would they feel comfortable doing that? No. According to the statements of the Prophet وسلم, and according to the statements of the Tabi'een and the Sahaba, you know what the soul of our prayer is? The soul, the ruh of our salah? It's khushu. <laughs> it's khushu. It's standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and feeling that He can see me, He is looking at me. And there's a hadith of the Prophet. Guys, think about this hadith. There's a hadith of the Prophet. That when you are facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as long as the face is turned towards Allah, Allah is turned towards you. When you're standing there in the prayer, He is facing you with His wajah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever manner that it is in. Can you imagine that Allah is facing you? Allah is looking at you, Allah is observing you. Like you're the only person in the world He is looking at you. Right? This is khushu'ah. To have a person who when he prays, when he is communicating with Allah, when we are talking to Allah, when we are reciting the Qur'an, that I sincerely feel, and guys, you know, all of us have heard this khutbah before, but how many of us when we're standing up there are thinking, man, this carpet is stitched wrong. Man, this uncle is burping next to me. Man, that kid is, you know, doing this. Man, somebody just stole my phone. Right? So that actually happened upstairs one time. Right? But how many of us are thinking these types of things? Man, Faisal's qira is sad today. Faisal's qira is happy today. He has the happy qira. Man, this sounds really pretty. And how many of us are thinking, I'm standing before my Lord in the same way that I'll be standing before Him on the Day of Judgment with my hands folded, asking Him to forgive me for what I've done and asking, me to, asking, asking Him to forgive me for what I've done and asking Him to enter me into His Jannah. How many of us think that while we're standing there? You know, Imam al-Ghazali, he said, when you stand in Salah, you should stand as if. You know, on the Day of Judgment, brothers, there will be a path laid across what? What will be below that path? Jahannam. The fire of Jannah. Who will be across that path? Jannah. And he said, you should stand on that, you should stand in prayer as if you are standing in, on that sirat. And when you say, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim, do you get it now? When you say, guide me on the straight sirat, <coughs> not only are you talking about the deen in this dunya, but you're talking about what? That sirat on the day of judgment. Guide me on the straight path. Because in fact, the two paths are the same. The path to Jannah on the Day of Judgment and the path to Jannah in this world are Islam. Are the deen, are your worship of Allah, are your clean intentions. Does that make sense? So when you stand there, how many of us are thinking of that? And how many of us are thinking of something else? This is khushur. That you are standing before Him. Why do you think it's called Yomul Qiyamah? The day of standing. Qiyam, right? Qiyam al You guys have heard that word before? Iqama, the standing of the prayer, the beginning of the prayer. Why do you think it's called Yomul Qiyamah? Because we'll be standing before him. And when Imam Faisal is there in Witr, how many of you guys were there for Witr today? Inshallah, all of us. I'll just pretend it's in I'm sure, I'm sure everyone prayed Witr somewhere. But when Imam Faisal is standing there and we're all behind him reciting this dua, what is the parallel on the Day of Judgment? Is our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is standing before Allah? We are standing as his ummah behind him, asking him, Ya Rasulullah, go to Allah and ask him to forgive us for our sins. And he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like the Imam in this world. It's a parallel, it's there to remind us of something. That we'll stand just like we're standing now. We'll stand in rows just like we're standing now. And we'll be before Allah and ask our Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, please go and ask Allah to forgive us. Because his anger is as of the anger that we've never seen before. And there the Prophet ﷺ goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as he said, Allah will teach him some words that no one has ever been taught before. To ask Allah for shifa for his ummah. When we stand in salah, that is what we should be thinking about. That I will be standing like this on the Day of Judgment. But on that day, I will not have clothes. Because he will be Maliki Yawm al-Din. Al Maliki Yawm al-Din. The owner of the Day of Judgment or the king of the Day of Judgment. Right? This is different, guys, this is different from theoretical understanding. The, oh yeah, I know, I know Abdul Sattar, I know we're going to be on the day of judgment. That's different from feeling it, because if we really thought about it, our hair would stand on end. 
our, tear, our, our, our eyes would be full of tears, we'd be crying out of the fact that we'll be like this on the Day of Judgment. But the fact that we think about it, the fact that we know it, but we're able to stand there and think about other things, it's a sign that that khushu has not entered our hearts. I'm not trying to be depressing, but I'm saying we have work to do to get there. Right? Just knowing it is not enough. And this is the biggest problem, I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, this is the biggest problem affecting us today. Because we have been, my generation and every generation after me or a little bit lower, the younger people younger than me, we've been exposed to so many lectures, so many talks, so many people who know what they're talking about, who don't know what they're talking about. So many people talking about Islam and khushu and taqwa, that every time we hear the same point, even though we're not implementing it, we think it's okay. I know this already. Why am I hearing this again? How many of us complain about khutbas? Listening to a khutbah. Man, I, t I heard this already. I know I'm supposed to pray Fajr. Well, do you pray Fajr? No. Oh. Right? So, there's a difference between knowing I have to have khushu and actually having khushu. And that takes work. Right? That takes dedication for me to actually sit there and do this. You know, I'm going to tell you a story. When the Prophet ﷺ, and you have to stay with me for the story a little bit. Some of you guys will think it's a little wacky, but it's, it's really not if you think about it. It's a little Sufi, but that's good in this month. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ, he went on a journey, on a famous journey. What is that journey called? al Isra al Miraj. Right? He went on this journey, and he had a communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this journey. And there was a point that they came to, and when they came to that point known as the Sidratul what? Mundaha, the boat tree, that demarcates the border between this world and the realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever that is. We don't know the details, but we know that it was a special place. What did Jibreel, Jibreel say to the Prophet at that point, according to a hadith? Some, some narrators quoted this hadith as being weak, others said it was Hassan but it's good enough to use for these types of, these types of issues. What did Jibreel say to the Prophet Go. Go, I can't follow you because why? I will be destroyed. Right, you guys remember that hadith? Everybody with me? He's going on the night journey. He comes to this point. Jibreel salam tells him, Jibreel salam tells him, <laughs> you go ahead, I can't go. And according to one of the narrations of the hadith, if I go beyond this, I will be annihilated. Meaning that anything Allah does not want to be past this point cannot exist. It'll be burned away. Are you guys with me there? Right? Think about that for a second. This is much better than Lord of the Rings, I promise you. Or Jedi Knights or anything. This is the best story ever. Okay? Anything that goes beyond this point will be annihilated. Because anything, the reason is because anything Allah does not desire to be past that point will not be there. Are you guys with me? Okay, number one. Number two. The Prophet said, what is the mi'raj of the believer, alhamdulillah? What is the mi'raj? Salah. The prayer is the mi'raj of the believer. Meaning what? That's the closest that you and I can ever get to being where the Prophet was in this dunya. Inshallah, in, in, in the next one, if we are blessed to, to, to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will. But in this dunya, that's the closest we can get. Right? Salah. It's praying Salah. So now take these two narrations and hold them in your mind. One, anything that goes beyond that point and stands before Allah, and Allah does not want it to be there, and it goes against His will, it will be burned away, right? Point number one. Point number two is, Salah is the miraj of the believer. Brothers, you know that feeling that you get? Keep these in mind, keep these in your, in your, in your you know, short-term memory for a second. You know that feeling that you get when you're standing in prayer? What do you feel sometimes? Does every, is everybody super happy about praying all the time? What do you guys feel sometimes? Someone tell me honestly. Fudger time, what do you feel? Man, I want to go to sleep. Right? I wish I could go to sleep. I'm so tired. Right? Sometimes you're standing in the way, what do you feel? I wish he would hurry up and finish. Yes or no? How many of you guys have felt that? But one guy who doesn't, man, I'm going to, I'm going to take by to you or something. That's awesome. <laughs> but... Everybody, you know, all of us feel that at some point, right? I wish he would finish. Why is he taking so long? Staying forever, right? Why do we feel that way? 
According to one of the ulama, he said, look, the reason that you feel this way is because now bring those two narrations together. Anything that is not acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be burned away when standing in front of His presence. Right? And salah is the mi'raj of the believer where you are able to stand before Allah. So what is happening when you stand before Allah, whether you like it or not, when you say Allahu Akbar and you make the intention, and in fact, you know the statement Allahu Akbar? In Arabic, when you say, you know, ana, ana akbaru minka, it means what? I'm bigger than you, right? If you say, ana atwaru minka, what does that mean? I'm taller than you. But if I don't put the minka after it, if I just leave the statement as is, it means naturally, in, in, according to Arabic grammar, min kulli shay. So when I say Allahu Akbar, I'm saying what? Allahu Akbar min? Allah is greater than all things. So whether you like it or not, whether we want to pray, we're in the zone, we're not in the zone, when you enter into salah with wudu, with an intention at least, right? I'm praying for Allah. Allahu Akbar, you are standing in His realm. You are standing before Allah and you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know what's happening? You know when Jibreel Islam said, if I go past this, I'll be burned away because it's not His will for me to be here? Every dirty thing in our heart, every disease, every sickness, every piece of arrogance, every piece of laziness, every piece of anger is being burned with fire. And the fact that your body doesn't want to be there, you know what I'm talking about? You stand in salon, you, things start to itch, you're like, man, what's going on, right? And your foot's hurting, it wasn't hurting a minute ago, but you started praying and now it's hurting. Yes or no? Right? Suddenly you're thinking about something, your phone starts to vibrate, you're like, man, I wonder what's going on. All these things start to suddenly happen. All this stuff is on your mind. Your body does not want to be in that position. It's fighting against this because it's being hurt. Your nafs is being hurt by the fact that you are standing in prayer, worshiping Allah. And if it's not used to that, it's going to fight it. And that's why we don't want to stand there. Does that make sense? That's why we don't want to stand there. It's because, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَلِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَى so Allah prohibits you from fahsha, from evil and disgusting things and from evil things. So Allah is something that when you stand there with the fear of Allah, it prevents these things from happening. It cleanses you of these things. And the fact that you're being cleansed, Mr. Clean from Jannah is being sprayed on your heart. That's why the heart burns. That's why you feel this pain. I don't want to be here. This is taking too long. Let me ask this in the chair. One second. Where do we want to move up to? Yes, sir. Can everyone see me now? Okay. So, my dear brothers, that's the point that we have to understand. Is that just knowing that I have to pray and I have to, I have to focus, that's not enough. It actually takes work. I actually have to stand there and do it. And when you feel that pain, how many of you guys have worked out before? How many of you guys work out? Right? I actually don't work out, but I've done it before, once or twice. You can probably tell. But I'm believing that. Right? When you work out, dude, it hurts. Yes or no? It hurts. The first time it hurts, especially if you haven't done it for a while, it hurts really bad. Right? You're sore the next day. You're like, man, actually you're sore two days after, right? Like, man, I can't move my arm, this and that, everything's sore, all this stuff. Why? Because you haven't done it in so long, your body's not used to it. So it hurts. That's the same thing that happens to us when we pray. And you haven't prayed in a long time, and you haven't focused, and you haven't actually worshipped Allah with that sincerity in a long time, it's going to hurt. Because that soul is being purified. So that's what we have to understand. Is that this is some, this feeling that you feel is good, number one. Number two, when you're praying, guys, that stuff that's coming into your head, that's the stuff that's keeping you away from Allah. Most of the time. You know, if you have a huge exam, that's different. You know, I mean, I understand you have an MCAT, you have an LSAT, you have, you have board, one, you know, board step ones, whatever. In that case, I understand, like, you know, that comes into your head. That's natural. Even Ali, he actually had a competition with some of the Sahaba. And the competition was, who can pray all the way through without thinking of anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Sahaba and Ali, they're praying. And Ali turns, is about to turn the first salam, he turns it, and he turns it, and he gets up and he's upset. And the Sahaba's like, what happened? He's like, I beat you guys until I turned the salam. I was about to turn the salam, and I was like, oh, I beat them. And then I was like, oh, man. I thought of something else was going to So that's natural, right? It's natural to think about other stuff. But what I'm trying to say is, 
when it's so consistent that you can't get a single rakah in without thinking of what's happening in the prayer, that's when we know we have something to work on. And it's okay. I'm not saying we're bad Muslims. I'm saying this is human nature. All right, so what can we do to have that type of feeling in our hearts? Let's talk about that. And inshallah, I'm actually taking too long. Number one, think about the, some, of the, some of those images that I just told you. Right, the day of judgment that you're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you're standing there, that He's before you. That's why the hadith says, worship Allah as if you see Him. And if you can't imagine that you see Him, then know that He sees you. That means something. That doesn't mean that you read the hadith and go, oh man, these hadiths are so cool. This is one of the most important hadith in Islam. It's number two in you know, this book. No. That means that when you're standing in prayer and you're thinking about whatever, right? I don't know how to beat Halo 4. Is Halo 4 even out yet? Yes. It is out. Okay. What's, the, what's, the, what's the one that's coming out right now? Assassin's Creed 4. Assassin's Creed 4, okay. You're thinking about Assassin's Creed 4. For Right? <laughs> once, once, once you have gray hair in your beard, then you know that uh, you, know, you don't know what's going on anymore. But, so that's number one, guys, is when you're actually standing in prayer, that's when you have to implement that hadith. Be like, man, Allah is watching me right now. And that takes work to do, I understand, right? Because you think about that and you think of something else. But that's the struggle. You have to actually work. It's a mind game. It's a game of the heart. And we can all focus when it comes to something like video games. You're like, you're, you're focused. You're not thinking about anything else. Your mom could be yelling about some food or a star in the next room. You don't care. Yes or no? You don't care what's going on. But in Salah, someone yells, some uncle is yelling from the back. Kids, stop playing in the back. And you're like, oh, what's, what's going on over there? You lose focus. Why is that? Because we're not as focused in prayer as we are when we're playing. Assassin's Creed, right? But the ability is there. Do you see what I'm trying to say? We have the ability to do it. It's just that we do it with the wrong thing sometimes. So that's what I'm trying to get at. So number one is we have to actually work. And every time, it's okay to screw up. You're standing in prayer. You think about something else. Now think about Allah. You're thinking about something else. Think about Allah. Think about something. Think about the fact that you have an Xbox. Alhamdulillah, yet Allah for giving me an Xbox. That's okay. At least now you're thinking about Allah. Whatever it takes to bring it back to Him. Because some of the mutasawifun, they say that the height of khushu, the height of taqwa, is that everything that you look at, everything that you see, it reminds you of Allah. Right? So if I look at this carpet, what do I think of? In Surah Al-Rahman, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the carpets of Jannah. When I think of this chair, what do I think of? The couches of Jannah that you'll be sitting upon, right? When you think about the fan, think about the fact that you'll have no issues about heating or cooling in Jannah. Every HVAC person will be unemployed, right? There's no air conditioning or heating necessary, right? When you think about, I don't know, you think about dates, Think about how there will be fruits in Jannah and people will eat them and say, this is what we used to eat before. Why are they saying that? Because they're amazed that it looks just like a date, but it tastes like something completely amazing, something completely different. Right? When they look at anything in this world, you look at the table, you think about how Isa and Islam asked Allah to send down a table spread for us from Jannah. Are you guys with me? You look at the ground, you think of the verse from Surah Al-Mulk where Allah says He spread out the earth for you so you can walk. You look at the stairs and you think to yourself, the darajat that Allah Do you see what I'm talking about? Everything you look at, everything you see, reminds you of something from His book, something from His word. And that once a person gets into this state, it becomes impossible for his limbs to commit sin. Because anything that he would sin with is reminding him of his word. Are you guys with me? So being in that state is the goal for us as believers. And it's not that difficult for us to get there, but it requires that first component that Brother Amir talked about, which is ilm. Right? Because how can you know that this chair reminds you of Surah Al-Rahman if you don't know the verse of Surah Al-Rahman? How can you know about any of these things unless we, you know, we know about how they're mentioned in the Quran? Right? You, even you're sitting at your exam, guys, and you're taking a test, and you think, no, what? Look at a pen, it reminds you of the book of Allah. But once a person comes to that point, may Allah give us that ability soon, inshallah, for all of us and our families. Once you come to that point, your body is unable to sin, and you reach that, 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 that level of la urid an urida illa ma 
I don't wish to will, and I don't want to want anything, Ya Allah, except what you want. And this, at this point, khushu becomes not only in salah, but khushu becomes something you do at every single moment of your life. You see how amazing that can be? Right? Because we are able to step into it sometimes when we play video games, when we hear a beautiful qiraat. But the trick is moving it into all the time. So number one, I'll conclude, number one is thinking about these images, right, of the Day of Judgment, of standing before Allah. Number two, knowing Allah's names. This is very important, and it's really simple, knowing Allah's names, right? We know the names of all kinds of other things, right? We know that the Galaxy S has, you know, five different versions. One of them is the Epic 4G, one of them is this, one of them is that. We know all the names for different things, but the names of our Lord, everyone knows Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, and then it kind of trails off, because that's the only part we remember from the song, right? You know what I'm talking about? That's all. So, knowing the names of Allah, and you can memorize one name a day. One name a day. It's so easy. It's just one word. I'm not asking you to memorize the Quran. I'm not asking you to memorize an ayah. I'm saying one name. Malik, Quddus, Salam, Mu'min, Muhammad. One name a day and what it means. That's it. Okay? So knowing the names of Allah, you know who you're worshiping, who you're standing in front of. And that's really intense because... Whenever you're in a situation where you're in some sort of difficulty, there is a name that will build you up. Meaning there is a name whose meaning will give you comfort to your heart. Right? There's something there. You committed a sin, you think Allah is al ghafur or He is al ghafar Right? You're worried about something, you're worried about the fact that you know you don't know what to do, you know He is al He is the one who has the light. You're, you have a lot of uh, disturbance in your life, you know He is as salam He is the bringer of peace. So every name that you know, your salah will become better because you start to think of him by these names. Alright? Guys, what was number one? Thinking about the images. Number two, thinking about the names. Number three, how many of you guys know Arabic in this room? Enough to understand the Quran. A couple of us, okay? So number three, this is a little bit more difficult to do, but it's possible, is start to understand what you are saying in your prayer. Guys, prayer should be a halaqa for us. Oh, we don't understand that. Right? I'll, end, I'll end on this point. I actually have a few more points, but I want to end here. And maybe you can talk uh, later on. Prayer should be like a halaqa for us. Could you imagine, right, all the Muslims who are upstairs today, could you imagine if they understood everything that was being said? Every time that Allah mentions something, then you know what it means. You know the advice. It's like you're going five times a day Saying, Ya Allah, what's your advice for me to live my life that it's given to you? Could you imagine? Even one verse. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in ja'akum fasiqum bi naba'im fatabayyanu. Oh, you who believe, if someone comes to you with news, verify it before you act upon it. Verify it before you act, before you do anything. Could you imagine if we just knew that piece of information, the, the level of backbiting in this community would go from like 99% to like 30 99% of all statistics are made up, so I just made that up. Right? So, I mean, just imagine that one verse, if we knew that, what it would do to our community. So imagine if all of us next year or the year after could stand in prayer and we knew exactly what was going on. What type of khushu would we have? And that, guys, really is the main reason a lot of us don't have it. That's really the main reason, because we're standing there and we don't know what's being said. It's just a repetition for us. And that's the reason the prayer came, was to reform our hearts. How is it going to be reformed if we don't know what's being said to us? So inshallah, these are the, there's actually a lot of, of points of advice. If you actually go to suhaibweb.com and type in the word khushu, there's a bunch of articles about it. I recommend that you read those. That's where I did some of my research for this talk. I told you I steal stuff, right? So try to do that. But my three simple points I'll give you is one, think about those images. You guys with me? Memorize these three points. Number two is what? Know his what? Names. Know the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, if you can learn Arabic, try and learn Arabic. And fine, you know what? If, you don't, if it's too much for you to learn Arabic right now, we don't have time for it, that's cool. Just learn the meanings of the few surahs that you know. Right? So that when you hear them, you're able to understand them. Or the popular surahs that people recite, Yasin, Al-Rahman, the 30th Juz. That'll just take a few months. Just read the, read the translation. It's not even that difficult. At least then, when it's being recited, you can focus on it. And I'm telling you, brothers, and I'll, Allah, I'll end on this last point. I'm fighting myself now, right? I'm telling you guys, when you really get into understanding what the Quran is saying, while you pray, dude, it's like watching TV in black and white versus watching TV in HD. 
It's a totally different. Could you imagine playing Halo in black and white? Would you enjoy that? <laughs> this game is so cool. Dude, it's black and white. What's wrong with you? Right? But watching it on an HGTV that's like the size of the wall, that's amazing, right? So when you hear little things in the salon and you understand what's going on, it changes everything, right? There's a simple verse, and this is what I wanted to end on. There's a simple verse, and that simple verse, I know, I said that like five times, but this, this is the point that I meant when I said the line. There's a simple verse, and it says uh, that in, in uh, Surah Al-Qiyamah, Right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that woe to you, then woe to you, woe to you, then woe to you. Okay? Four times. The entire surah is about qiyamah. And then it says, Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. That's how it's translated. That kind of sucks, right? Because that doesn't mean anything to us. If you read the translation, you understood what's happening, and you read a little bit of the seer, you had a better understanding of the Quran, you would realize that actually what's happening there is that a loss, the first two woes, the first two wail, it's actually talking about the disbeliever and how when he dies, there's the pain of death, right, due to his disbelief. And then when he's in the grave, the punishment of the grave. Those are the first two woes. Then the word fa is used in the Quran. Okay, sorry, the word is used in the Quran, denoting a break in time. And then two other woes are mentioned, woe to you, then woe to you again. Talking about the punishment on the day of judgment when he's standing before Allah and he's being punished while he's there. And then finally, which punishment comes after that? The punishment of Jahannam. Imagine standing in Salah and recognizing that for every ayah that you hear. What's happening? That flips the script. That is Hoshua. So I'll end with that. Jazakallah okay. If anything I've said is incorrect, it's for me. If anything good that was came. I uh, came from uh, Allah SWT and the people I stole from. So that will take some. هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى 